All right. Well, good, good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. How's everybody doing today? All right. Very good. Well, listen, it's truly an honor and a pleasure to be with you all this morning. And I always say that when I'm before a group of service members like yourselves, Marines and Navy, and do we have anybody in here besides Marine Corps and Navy? Okay. No Coasties or nobody willing to admit? Or, okay. All right, but any that it's, it's, it's really an honor, always an honor to be among uh, of the greatest, the greatest Americans, and that's you folks. Thank you for your service and what you've done f for us over the number of years that you've been, been doing this. So what we're gonna talk about today is some of the financial aspects that you need to think about in terms of transitioning um, into the next phase of your life, civilian life. I understand, I'm told that a number of you are considering uh, making that change. So uh, the financial aspects are an important consideration. And uh, just so you, you know, my name is, uh, Anna's passing out the, hand, the uh, handouts, or the, the slides we're gonna be going through as well as some other handouts. Um, make sure you get one of those. But uh, my name is Craig, and I'm the director of the financial management program up at Miramar. And some of you might know Mike McIsaac. He's uh, uh, my counterpart here down at uh, MCRD. Mike, however, today, he and his wife are in Hawaii. So how, ma how many of us wish that we could trade places with him today? <laughs> okay. Well, I hope he's having a great time. He deserves it. Okay, so what I do uh, at Miramar and and by the way, we all work together, both Mike and I do, so you know, we, we, uh, you, know, you can call any of us uh, for, for help that you might need. And uh, now you all have a copy of the slides, and the first slide, of course, has my contact information on it. So in case you have any questions later on, you can give me a call. But essentially what I do is I work with people to hopefully set them on a course to financial success. And of course, that's what I'd like to talk to you folks about today is planning for your transition. Because you know, people don't plan to fail, but they often do fail to plan. And uh, uh, so we wanna get you starting to think about that process today. And the first step in that process, if you would take a look at your handouts that I gave you, uh, is a goals worksheet. And this is where it all starts. I would encourage you now to begin to think about and to plan, if you, if, you're, if you have a spouse as well, to plan together um, how you want your financial life, what you want your financial life to look like. In the short term, which would be the top section, say in the next six months to a year when you transition, what changes or improvements would you like to see? And prioritize them. And figure out, for example, if you wanna have you know, another thousand dollars in our savings account in 10 months. We're gonna need a hundred dollars a month for 10 months, right? So begin to formulate that into dollars and cents, what it's gonna take for you to attain that particular goal. And then do the same thing for the midterm in the next five years. And then the bottom section is for the long-term stuff beyond that, the stuff over your lifetime that you wanna be thinking about, okay? This is where it all starts, beginning to really spend some time thinking about where it is that you want to go. Okay, I, I think it's interesting to note this quote that's on the screen from uh, Henry Ford. We all know who Henry Ford is, right? Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the inventor of, of the, the thing that we drive around all the time. And uh, he said, you don't get rich by what you earn. You get by, rich by what you don't spend. So. Begin to think about that today as we, as we go through this class. The reality though is, according to the Social Security Administration Department, only 2% of the people currently receiving Social Security today are self-sustaining. In other words, 98% of the people are one check away from the welfare lines. Obviously, these people didn't plan very well. My objective here today is to get you guys thinking about um, ways to avoid being being part of that 98%. I don't want you guys to be 98%ers. I want you guys to be two percenters. And so today we're gonna to talk about you know, some, some ways that you can begin to do that. Okay, also, 
Another thing that's happening these days is a lot of folks are having struggling with this. If you look at a timeline from 1960 to today, the blue line is the savings rate. Notice that back in 1960, the average American had about 8% of whatever money they earned that they could save and invest. And then it bounced up and down to about what early 80s and just kind of fell off the cliff. Recently, now it's up to about 4% or so. People are, because of the economic times, are beginning to save a little bit more for a rainy day, so to speak, because that civilian employer can come in someday and say, hey, we love you, you do great work, but we're sorry, you know, business is bad. And that's happening to a lot of folks. So, um, so people are saving a little bit more. At the same time, look at the red line, debt, expressed as a percentage of household income. And we do it this way because obviously incomes were a lot less back in 1960 than they are today. But as a percentage, you can't see it over here. I'm sorry the computer cut it off, but this is 50% and then it goes up to 150%. So back in 1960, the average American owed about half of their annual income and in consumer debt, which is credit cards and car loans, things of that nature. Okay, so if the average income was, say, 20,000, 20, that would be roughly about 10,000. But nowadays, if the average income, say, is 50, just as an example, 150%, you know, is going to be approximately $75,000. The average American has for that level of income and in consumer debt, credit cards, car loans. Think about that. Start adding up in your own. How much do I owe? You know, if you add all that stuff up together, student loans. By the way, stu you know, the number one consumer debt in this nation right now, it just changed within the last year. You know what that is? Student loans. Student loans are now uh, the, the most, the highest um, debt in the country, passed up credit cards. Okay, so this is why I want to start out with debt. Debt is by far the biggest obstacle I see to people being financially successful. Interest not earned, excuse me, let me back up. Interest not paid is interest earned. Okay, so think about that. I'm a big believer in getting debt paid off and getting control of your, your debt lives. And um, what you see here is FICO credit score goes from 300 to 850 is the maximum. If you're 740 and above, that's considered excellent. I would encourage everybody to get a copy of their credit report at that website, annualcreditreport.com. Um, is a free site you can go to to get a copy of your report. Employers are routinely checking credit reports now. So you want to make sure that the stuff that's on your credit report is accurate and true. So take a look at it and you can easily uh, fix the stuff, dispute the things that are not true on there and get them corrected on your credit report. So I definitely suggest that you do that. However, um, and these are three credit bureaus, and you can do this once a year for free from each of the three credit bureaus. However, they will, at that site, they will charge you an additional uh, $7.95 to get a copy of your credit report. But if you would, please, just for today, okay, we have a special offer for you folks just for today. If you would flip over, no, I'm not going to try to sell you something. Don't worry. Okay. Uh, if you would flip over to the fourth page, you'll see... Um, a, t a page entitled SaveAndInvest.org at the top. Step-by-step -step instructions to authorize use of credit score analysis. Okay, so if you would, go to that website, and you've, in the lower left-hand corner you've got the website, and click on Register for free FICO credit score. And it will walk you through it. At some point, it will ask you for a code number. And the code is in the center of the page there, the uh, um, eight eight-digit uh, or eight-letter code that I have written down there. It's good through the end of May. And this works for, for uh, service members as well as spouses and also DOD employees as well. Okay? And with that code number, you can get access to your credit report for free and also credit, FICO credit score. And what I like about this particular site also is that it will, it will give you um, suggestions on how what steps you can take specifically based on your, that will actually analyze your particular credit report and, tell you, and give you a rating and, and give you suggestions on what specifically you should do, what steps you should take to improve it. And you'll be able to go back to the site for the next 30 days free of charge. 
So it's a great tool. I encourage you to take, take advantage of it. Okay? And the next page, I gave you a sample credit report. And on the back page of that is a guide that shows you uh, the various sections of the credit report, how to read it. This is a condensed, summarized version of a credit report. A credit report can be anywhere from 10 or 12 pages up to, I've seen some 30 pages long. Okay, but that's just one page there to show you the different sections of it. Um, but when you look at your credit report, it'll be the same thing. It'll just be an expanded version. Okay, so definitely yeah, consider getting a copy of your credit report and going, going to the site um, to get your credit score. Okay, so your, your credit score is made up essentially of five different categories. And payment history represents 35% of your credit score. So people ask me, how can I improve my credit score? Number one, start paying your bills on time. Okay, and eventually the, the bad stuff that's on there will start getting pushed out of the way once it's over three, four, five years old. Its effect becomes reduced, and the stuff you're doing over the last three years becomes more, um, have, has more an effect. Okay, so if you had charge-off accounts uh, where you, uh, the creditor gave up collecting, or there's collection accounts where they sold it to a collection agency, those kinds of things are going to substantially um, uh, affect your credit report in a bad way. Okay. Debt, 30% of your credit score comes from debt, percentage of debt. So if you pay off your debt, that's going to improve your credit score as well. Okay, and if you're maxing out your credit cards, that's going to really substantially adversely affect your credit score as well. So what I tell folks is you want to keep your credit card balances down to 30% or less of your available credit. So if you have a $3,000 limit, you should try to keep that balance to $1,000 and below, because once it goes over 1000 you know, it's going to lower your credit score. So keep those balances down. Uh, you might also increase your limit. That also lowers your, the, the amount of your credit that you're using, too. Okay? So that would be another way of doing it. But better, make sure you get the debt paid off. So there are other stuff. Length of history, new credit, new, new applications for credit, and also inquiries for credit with other creditors. Um, represent less than a third of your credit score. Those other items, two thirds right there. So uh, that's really the key to developing good credit history is paying your bills on time and paying off your balances. As you can see from this chart, 60% of the population are 700 and above, 40% are below. And uh, the ones down here should, be, should try to get up to 700. And 740 and above is considered excellent. Okay, so if you're below 700, you've definitely got some room for improvement. And as you can see, it is going to affect your ability to qualify for loans, which you're going to pay in interest rates. And also, as I mentioned, employers are checking credit reports as well. So you want to make sure that, they're, um, um, that you're taking good care of your credit. So how can you improve your score? Number one, fix your mistakes. Number two, um, Make sure that you protect your identity. Okay, you can file uh, for you folks on active duty or spouses as well uh, of active duty. You can uh, file what's called an active duty alert on, um, on your account, which uh, then will require any creditor, the credit bureau will require, be required to inform you of any creditor that um, asked to look at your credit report. And before they release it, they'll confirm with you that you approve. So it helps reduce the, like, the, the possibility of identity theft. Okay, also pay off your debt, which we talked about. Uh, establish history, that's a website. PRBC is a website that keeps track of um, rental payments and um, phone bills and uh, utility bill payments, things that are not normally included on a credit report. So there are ways that creditors can also check your credit history and paying your bills on time. Uh, with those kinds of things as well. Be careful about applying all over town when you, when you sign up for a, a, a store. Uh, when you go to a store and they offer a discount uh, if you find, sign up for their store card, they're going to pull a copy of your credit report. So obviously if you do that to every store you walk into, pretty soon you're going to have a long list of inquiries, which is going to lower your credit score. So you want to be careful about that. Um, if you cancel 
credit actually, initially it can actually lower your credit score initially, but eventually that within a few months that should, uh, the, the effect is relatively short lived. But I only mention it because if you're going, for example, to get a mortgage or a car loan, you, you don't want to be canceling a bunch of accounts just before you do that because it could lower your credit score. Okay. Authorized user. This is where um, you are a, um, uh, somebody else's, it's their credit card and you're listed as a user. They don't pay their bill on time, guess what, it's gonna show up on your credit report. Okay, so be careful of that and if that's a concern, maybe you might wanna break and make arrangements to get, uh, get off the, the account, yes? Okay, so the question is, uh, what happens if you reduce your available credit? Uh, what, how does that affect your credit score? Well, actually it can help, excuse me, it, it, it can hurt, I should say, because what happens is it's gonna increase the percentage of your available credit that you're using. So for example, let's say, let's say that you have three, you have three credit cards, $1,000 limit on each of the three. You have $3,000 available credit. And let's say you've, you currently owe 1,000 combining all the cards together, that's how much you owe on all three of them combined. And let's say you cancel one of the cards. So now you have $2,000 in available credit. But let's say that you still owe 1,000 because the, the two, let's say two of the cards you had most, most of the uh, credit on. So what you've done is you've effectively um, increased your percentage of utilization from a third, 30%, up to 50%. So that, that can you know, also lower your credit score. Good point. Vice versa, you can lower that percentage by increasing your credit limit. If you keep the balances the same and increase the credit, that's gonna lower your utilization as well on the other side of the coin. Yeah. Thank you, good question. Okay, so credit cards com companies tell us that two thirds of the payments they receive are minimum payments. All right, a minimum payment typically is 2% of the balance. So if you have a $1,000 credit balance at an 18% interest rate, $20 a month, look how long it's gonna take you to pay that debt off and how much you're gonna pay in interest. Quite a bit, okay? Now what happens if you do 5%, $50 a month? Look how much sooner you get it paid off and how much you save in interest. Big difference. So avoid minimum, what they say is the minimum payment. You should be making, your minimum should be much higher than that to get the debt paid off as soon as possible, okay? And I would say 5% probably is a good, if you have to pay a minimal amount, that's, that's what you wanna probably shoot for. And hopefully over time you can you know, pay more than that to get the debt paid off. The whole point of this is that, like I said before, interest not paid is interest earned. So if you pay off debt, that's gonna enable you to do more investing and saving, right? And that's really what it's all about. To be financially successful is saving and investing. Well, up here we've got some long-term rates of return on several different um, types of, of financial um, instruments. And we're gonna take a look at stocks first of all. And stocks are where you have ownership, shares of companies. When you invest in a stock, you actually own a share of that company. And so as that company's value increases over time, the share price goes up, it's sort of like, you know, you have, have ownership, um, you know, of a portion of that company, all right? Uh, the, the large company stocks we're referring to here are the Standard & Poor's 500. These are the 500 companies on the S&P 500, largest 500 U.S. companies. Over the last 100 years, average about 11.3%. Now when I say rate of return, I'm talking about a yearly interest rate of return. So let's say for example, you invest $1,000. And uh, let's say you earn 10%. So how much do we earn in interest at the end of one year? 10% of 1,000 is what? $100, right. So we have $1,100 in the account at the end of year one. Now let's say we do another 10% now on that $1,100 how much interest are we gonna earn in year two? 110, right? 10% of any number just drop off the last digit, 
So 1,100 would be 110. So now we have 1,210 in the account. Let's say the third year, and I promise this is the last year I'm going to do this. Uh, 1,210, 10% 10 of 1,210 is what? 121, right? 1, 2, 1, 0, drop off to 0, 121. So we, get, we went from 100 in interest to 110 to 121 because we've got interest on our money, interest on interest. So this is how compounding interest works. And this is what we're talking about here in this situation. So 11.3% on average. Understand that's not guaranteed. The stock market goes up and it goes down. And actually, over the last 100 years or so, on average, about one-third of the years, the market has lost money. Two-thirds of the years, it makes money. And that's why you get the 11%. If you look at graphs, you'll see it's kind of a rocky road, but uh, uh, on average, that's what it is. Small company stocks, about 12.6%. Bonds are where you're loaning money to somebody and earning interest in return. So if you loan money to the federal government, into what we call short and midterm type loans, uh, about 5%. Okay, short term loans though would be your treasury bills to the government, 3.8. Now I show you this because inflation is at 3.1% on average, which means that inflation is what? Increasing prices, right? Okay, well, at 3% inflation, which is what we average in this nation, that means that every 24 years, prices double. Okay, so in reality, your real rate of return, for example, if you earned 11%, your real rate of return after inflation is 8%. So the real rate is always subtract, you subtract the inflation rate to get to the real rate. How many of you here today, as we sit here today, are earning, have money in a savings account somewhere? Okay, you're probably earning, what, maybe a quarter or a half of 1%. On that, and email, we have three or four percent inflation. So um, it's not a comforting thought, I know, but uh, you're probably actually losing money every day in your savings account. But we st I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that. I, you know, the savings is there for a purpose, it's for an emergency need that you can get. You know, for that, we kind of give up, you know, the rate on that. It's a temporary parking lot for money. But the reality, though, is if you're not earning inflation rates, you know, you're actually losing money in the long term. Okay, here's a little chart that shows you. Here's your small company stocks, your large company stocks, and then here's your bonds and the treasury bills. These are the same things I just talked about. And this is over an 80-year period of time from 1926 to 06. Over that period of time, take a look at the rates of return. That's consistent with what I told you, 10 and 12% on the stocks, 5% on the bonds, 3% or so on your treasury bills. But take a look at this. In the best of those 80 years, small company stocks we're up as high as 142% in one of those 80 years. 100% is double, 200% is triple. So that's a lot of growth in one year. But also one year, these guys were down 58%, which would be like a $10,000 investment on January 1st becomes $4,200 on December 31, okay? So this is what we call volatility, fluctuation. As you can see, there's a lot of, there's more movement up and down, but also, look at this, there's, there's more fluctuation as you go this way, but also the rate of return goes up. As you go this way, you get safety, you don't have this volatility, but you also have reduced returns. So the moral of the story is that, you know, if you're investing for the long term, you know that, you know, stocks are going to outperform uh, bonds in the long term. Uh, if you're the type of investor, though, that needs the money soon, then you might need to be more conservative and protect it more over here. But if you're investing for a long term, you can realize, yeah, the stocks are going to go up and down, and yes, sometimes I'm going to lose money. But if I invest over a long enough period of time, the results are going to be there. Okay? Patience. Uh, the market rewards patience. Okay? Here's a graph of the S&P 500 from 1950 to today. That's what we call volatility, right? You can see all the, all the ups and downs in here. But if you draw a line through this, it's going up, isn't it? So what's it going to be like over here for you guys in 30 years? Okay? History tends to repeat itself. So I think you can, you know, it's something you want to think about. Here's a, 
graph of the Dow Jones Industrial Average from 1900 to today. Back in 1900, it was 61. Today, as I looked at the paper this morning, it was 12,600 up here. Uh, so as you see, it's, uh, over time, it's gone up. But yeah, there's a lot of volatility, isn't there? It's interesting to look at this because you can identify periods of history by looking at these financial results. Everybody knows what that is there. 381 dropped down to 41. The Great Depression, 1929. You can see it right there. And as you can see, it took a little bit of time to get out of that until we, World War II hit. And uh, we kind of came out of it. And then after World War II, we had tremendous growth from 19 from the mid-1940s to 1960. Okay, from 1960 to 80, kind of flat. And then look at this, 1980 to 2000. Tremendous growth, the age of technology. That's when Bill Gates and his buddies were in the garage creating all these weird things and whatever else they were doing. And then it all, you know, it went crazy. Tremendous growth. The last 10 years, Kind of a roller coaster ride. Okay, but once again, what's it going to be over here? Okay, the power of compounding interest is truly amazing. In fact, Albert Einstein once said that it's the greatest concept known to man, the power of compounding interest. In fact, recently somebody asked Warren Buffett, the richest man in America, um, what he thought the Dow would be going to. And he said a million. And the reporter, then asked the most important question, which is when? And he said, by the end of the century. So he says, by the year 2100, it'll be a million. It's 12,600 12, today. Well, if you run the numbers on that, that would require to go from 12,600 today to a million in 88 years would require a 7% annual rate of return. I've already shown you, his, history says it's you know 11 to 12% on average. So. It is realistic when you, when you look at it long term. All right, here's a chart that shows you five different individuals ranging in age from 45 to 18. And they all want to be, have a million dollars by the time they're 60. Okay, we're going to assume a 10% rate of return only because historically we know that's what stocks have done. Although there is a risk, I would never project a 10% percent rate of return for somebody over a short period of time of 15 years or something like that because the shorter time period you know the more conservative you want to be in your estimates because you never know the market can have a bad 10 years it happens occasionally uh, but just for sake of illustration a 10 percent rate of return the 45 year old in 15 years invests 472,000 and has a million dollars 26, 23 per month, that's, that's a hunk of change, okay? Let's say the 35 year old starts 10 years sooner, a little bit better. A quarter of a million becomes a million at 848 a month. The 30 year old and so on. You can see what's happening here, okay? The sooner you start, the better the numbers, okay? So um, I would encourage you to begin thinking about earning interest, not paying it because look what it can do for you. Okay, pretty amazing. Okay, the financial pyramid is, this is not a pyramid scheme here we're gonna talk about, but I show you this because I want you to, to understand the general relationship between various stages of uh, financial management. And the idea is that you, you start at the foundation and then you build up to the top. And the foundation is making sure that you're managing your money in such a way that your spending and income are in balance. In other words, you're not spending more than you make. And a lot of folks I talk to are doing just that. And a lot of them don't even know it until I show them, yeah, you're spending more than you make. Because they're putting it on, on debt and they, they're, doing, they're handling their payments, everything's just fine. Uh, but the reality is um, oftentimes that they are just doing just that. All right, assuming that you can develop some discretionary uh, income to be able to save, then the next step would be then to be establish an emergency fund. And the recommended amount for an emergency fund is three to six times living expenses. So take a look at your monthly living expenses and multiply that by three 
or six, somewhere between those two numbers is where you should ideally be in terms of having an emergency fund. And granted, it's gonna probably be in a low interest savings account somewhere or a money market account, which is another, probably the highest uh, interest savings account that you're gonna qualify for, money market account, okay? Uh, and then also reserving, setting aside for funds that you plan on spending during the year, such as car maintenance, clothing, travel, gift giving. These are things people spend hundreds of dollars a year on. You know, to say if you're, if you're gonna spend $1,200 a year on travel, then you should be setting aside $100 every month for the travel fund, a reserve account. So that why? So that you don't have to slide the card through when it comes time to pay for it and pay for that vacation for the next five or 10 years. Plan for it. Okay, then assuming you're doing all that, we can now graduate to the investment level, stocks and bonds, which we talked about. Mutual funds are accounts that contain hundreds of different stocks and bonds where uh, mutual fund companies pool their investors' money um, into large investments of stocks. And uh, uh, this allows you to invest in, in a number of different companies at one time by making one investment. You can also own real estate. You can own the home you live in. You can own a property um, and rent it out, let somebody else make your mortgage payment for you, hopefully enough to cover the mortgage. Uh, those are all forms of real estate investment. Hard assets like gold, silver, um, things of that nature, pork bellies, those are what we call commodities, hard assets. And I'm not gonna go into options and commodities. That's beyond the scope of this class. But um, just understand that there are various, there, there's, a, there's a process to follow. Sometimes I see people, I love them, they come in, they're doing TSP, and yet they're spending more than they make and they're in debt up to their ears. They're backwards. I, I like the fact that they're trying to invest, but hey, you know, you're paying more on your, your debt accounts than what you're ever going to earn on your TSP, you know, get the debt paid off first. So there's an order, there's a priority, a sequence that, that needs to be followed. Okay, home ownership, yeah, I think it's a great uh, way to go and, and, and your payment should never be more than 28% of your income. If it is, it's going to make it very difficult for you to be able to invest. Will mortgage companies allow you to, to have a mortgage more than 28% of your income? Yeah, they do. Probably not a wise thing, though. It, and then it becomes a situation like, who owns who? Does the house own you, or do you own the house? Okay, because there's no money left over to do anything else with. So, um, you know, 28% is, is the recommended guideline. If, if, you're, if, if you're interested in owning home ownership, I would encourage you to go to this website, credideducation.org, and sign up for a class. They're offered every week in San Diego through Consumer Credit Counseling Services. It's an excellent class teach you about the home buying process, uh, how to apply for a loan, life as a homeowner, talk about VA uh, loans and all kinds of things like that. So um, I would encourage you to, to go to that class if that's of interest to you. Okay, so let's talk about, is there a clock in here? Okay. So what time do I end here? Anybody, what time is it? That's all right. Just tell me, give me the, the two-minute warning when it's time, and I'll speed it up. Um, anyway, okay, retirement. There's basically two kinds of retirement plans. You've got defined benefit, which is like a pension plan. What does that say? Five. Five minutes? Okay, I'm going to have to speed it up here. We've got a little bit of a late start, I think. Anyway, military pension, that's if you, live, if you stay in for 20 years, you have a pension plan. The other kind is where you invest and contribute your own, on your own, such as thrift and savings plan. 401ks are similar to that. These are plans offered by employers, civilian employers, corporations, and whatnot. And oftentimes they offer matching funds, where they match what you put in up to a certain percentage. Unfortunately, TSP does not have matching funds. Um, you can only put in a portion of your pay, which you elect to put in on a monthly basis. Okay, um, some of the benefits of TSP, the money's invested before it's taxed and it grows tax deferred. No tax is paid while it's growing. Uh, you, you determine how much of your pay you want to go in there. You can invest up to $17,000 a year or as, or as little as 1%. Very low cost involved to maintain the account, easy to start. And uh, when you get out of the military, you'll be able to take that money with you 
and reinvest it somewhere else. There are some penalties if you take the money out and buy a Corvette, though. Okay, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. All right, you choose the beneficiary, so as a death benefit, if you pass away, you can elect you know, who the money goes to. This is what happens if you take the money out and buy a Corvette, okay? Um, before age 59 and a half, you're going to pay taxes plus a 10% penalty, which is going to be about a 30% loss. So you're going to end up with $7,000, $3,000 in, um, in lost fees and taxes. So not a good thing. Okay, so your choices are when you get out, you can leave the money in TSP and let it sit there, and you can, you can manage the investments and how you want the money invested. You can't add to it anymore unless you have mil uh, government pay to, uh, that you're earning, such as GS or uh, reserve pay, something on that issue. You can reinvest, you can invest it, continue to invest in TSP. You can also transfer it to an individual retirement account. Okay, we'll talk about what that is in a little bit. It's, like, it's an account like the TSP, tax deferred growth. You can just roll it into that, you know, and you avoid paying taxes and penalties that way. Okay, and you can also transfer, would be like to transfer to government service or reserve. You can transfer it over there. But withdrawing funds, that's the worst, okay? You want to avoid that. Don't do that. You're going to lose too much money if you do that. These are the five different investment options you have on TSP. Okay, your G and the F are your bond funds. The G fund, you're loaning money to Uncle Sam, the government. The F fund, you're loaning money to corporate America. But these guys are in the 2 to 4% range rate of return. Stocks, CS and I, I call this the crime scene investigation investment account. So you guys will always remember what they are. The C actually stands for common stocks of the S&P 500. So these are the 500 companies on the S&P if you want to invest in all those large companies. Uh, the S fund is your smaller company stocks on the U.S. market, total stock market index. These are called indexed mutual funds where you're investing in a lot of companies on an index as opposed to a managed mutual fund, which is where you have a fund manager that decides what stocks to buy and sell. The reality is though most fund managers do not outperform the indexes. So most people can do better just investing in the indexes. Investment people won't tell you that, though, because guess what? They don't get paid on index funds. The fees and expenses are very low. So uh, but it's something you want to keep in mind. I fund is international. Europe, Australia, and the Far East, 1,200 companies. So we're talking 500, uh, 5,000, 1,200, 6,700 different companies you can invest in in the CS and the I, which is a, a good choice for folks that are investing for 20 or more years in time you should, be most, you should be pretty aggressive, mostly investing in stocks, because I've shown you they have the best rate of return. Okay? Now, if you don't want to have to decide what, how much to put where, you can do what's called life cycle fund, where you select a target retirement date, and then TSP automatically puts you into a, uh, a, um, a strategy based on that, on your age and your time horizon. So, for example, if you choose a 2050 fund, this would be for a person in their 20s, let's say, um, they're going to have the, the blue-gray is the bonds, so about 10% going into bonds, 90% stocks. If you do the 2040, 20% bonds, 80% stocks, 2030 is like about 30% bonds, 70% stocks. All right, so as you can see, the, the longer the time horizon, the more aggressive they're putting you into stocks, which makes sense. That goes along with what I showed you earlier there on, on the other chart we looked at. Okay, uh, individual retirement accounts, there's two kinds. There's traditional and Roth. We're going to start with traditional. And in traditional, you, can, you are able to deduct the investment you make just like you can on TSP as long as your income doesn't exceed certain guidelines, okay? Up to $5,000 a year as opposed to $17,000 in TSP. So married couple, $10,000. Money grows tax deferred. Gains are taxed. Just like TSP, you pay taxes on the money you take out someday after age 59 and a half. There's penalties if you do before 59 and a half. I don't think anybody's worried about being 70 yet. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you can roll your TSP into an IRA account with the financial institution if you want to do that when you get out. You avoid penalties, and then it will continue on um, as an investment from then on. Okay, and you choose the investments. Now, many of the investment companies have target funds now which are very similar to the life cycle. Same kind of concept. Okay, Roth IRA is a little bit different in that there's no deduction for the investment you make, so the money goes in after taxes, and um, it's tax-free growth. 
not tax deferred, meaning if it grows to a million dollars, all that money is yours tax free, zero taxes on it. I love Roths, okay? For most of you, that's probably going to be the best way to go, and you can do up to 5000 a year. Now, here's the good news. TSP is going to go Roth in November. You will be able to elect to have your TSP um, investment grow tax-free in November, and I would say do it, okay? You can't change what you've invested already. That's going to still be treated tax-deferred, but from then on, after November, whatever investments you make will grow tax-free. Okay. Question. Can I roll the, uh, yes. Roth? Yes. When you get out, you can roll your TSP into a Roth IRA, but then you have to pay how much time? One minute. Okay, we're going to wrap it up. Yes. Yeah, so you can roll it in to a, a Roth IRA when you get out. Yeah. You will have to pay claim it as income though and pay taxes on it when you do it, but you can do that. Okay. So once again, you choose the investments. Pay yourself first. Make sure that you're investing 10 to 15% of your income. Okay, that's number one. I gave you, in your handouts, I gave you a net worth um, statement on the second page of your handout. Everybody should keep track of their net worth, which is the difference between what they, um, uh, what they own less what they owe. You should always also have a budget, and I gave you a budget worksheet here, and you can track it for six months on your income and your expenses as well for six months. So take advantage of, of that uh, budget sheet. Everybody, you should know every month where your money's going and make sure it goes where you want it to go, okay? So I gave you some sheets here you can use for that. Um, always make sure that your living expenses are no more than 70% of your income, your debt, maximum 20%. And I gave you a worksheet on your next page of your handout, debt management, where you can um, add up your credit cards and auto loans, all your debts, and divide it by your income to determine what percentage of your income goes to debt. And if it's at 20% or more, you definitely need to get it paid off. Um, if you do have a lot of debt you want to get paid off, think about doing a power payment plan. And this is where um, you, uh, you decide you, how much money you're going to allocate to paying your debt off. And as you, as you get debt one paid off, Instead of partying and say, hey, great, I, you know, I have less money every month, you take that money you're paying on debt one to debt two. And then when debt two is paid off, what you're paying on one and two to debt three. So it's like a reverse snowball effect. There's a website you can go on to, and I gave you an example of it on the last two pages of your handout. Um, but you can go to that site. It's powerpay.org. If you would look at the last two pages on your handout, and I've got the website for you and an example of how a person used this to get out of debt. And basically, the bottom line is they saved uh, about seven years in time and about $3,800 in interest by putting extra money towards their debt. So you can go through that and, and um, plug in your own information. So um, some of us have to do plastic surgery. Get rid of the credit cards, put them in the freezer, whatever it takes. Um, you know, you might want to look at that. And get control of where your money's going. You know, find, it, you know, find out, uh, you know, uh, to track your expenses to find out where your money's going and make sure that you're doing that saving and investing. I'm going to skip over this. Just be aware of the fact that when you get out, your income, you're going to have to earn more to net out the same amount because you're going to pay taxes on all of your money. Remember, E4 five years, gross pay 49, but they're only paying taxes on that. Civilian, that same person is going to have to earn 57000 to net the same amount because now they're going to pay income taxes on all that and also Social Security taxes. There's a website I gave you in there where you can run the numbers on your own situation. Uh, here's an 03, uh, and you can see the difference between civilian pay and military pay because of the fact you're not paying as much in taxes. Uh, life insurance, you're going to lose SGLI. Make sure that you do this before you get out. Well, you know, if you're going to replace your life insurance, apply now so that if you're not eligible for some reason, some medical condition, you can always get VGLI, which is guaranteed. It's more expensive, but it's guaranteed if you need that. I know TRICARE is going to come in and talk to you, so I'm going to skip over that. Okay, so the bottom line is you want to begin to look at managing your money, uh, cleaning up the past, to begin thinking about saving and investing for the future. And if you need any help on this, you're certainly welcome to give me a call. Uh, Mike McIsaac here at MCRD is also available when he gets back from Hawaii. 
um, he'll be available for that as well. So are there any last minute questions before I head out of here? Amore. Okay. The question is, what are the risks of, of going in no money down on a home purchase? The risk is, what if uh, houses continue to lose money? And then you're up, upside down. You owe more on the house than what it's worth. And then let's say then you can't sell then. Uh, you know, a lot of people are having this problem today. And you can't refinance because you're upside down. So, uh, so the, it's always best if you can to come in have some skin in the game, come in with a little bit down. Uh, you'll also save on your VA funding fees and your PMIs, uh, uh, primary mortgage insurance, by coming in with a down payment. It actually costs you a little bit less on the loan. So um, I always encourage people, although you can get in VA now up to, what, 0% down up to 416000 even more than that in San Diego, because they do go VA jumbo now, too, even up above that if necessary. But, um, but yeah, I would encourage people to you know, to try to come in with at least a 10% down payment if they can. Whatever you can, you know, some down payment would be recommended. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. All right, well, thank you once again. I want to uh, thank you all uh, for your service. Thank you for what you've done. And um, to, to also spouses as well. I know we have some spouses in here because I know you serve right alongside and you make all the commitments and sacrifices as well. So thank you. Thanks to all of you for that. I wish you all the best in your future, and, um, and I invite you. Go ahead, give, go ahead, make my day, give me a call. I'd be more than happy to sit down and begin to talk about your financial plan going forward and maybe show you a system you can use to maybe manage your money a little better. Okay? So thank you very much, and good luck to you all.